Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Tom Concolino, and I'm here with our presenters, Aya Takase and Angela Criswell. Hi, hey, everyone. Thank you for attending Ragaku's webinar series on X-ray computed tomography for materials and life science. This session is on demystifying reconstruction using ImageJ. This is the third of four section, sessions looking into image processing. In this session, Aya and Angela will discuss in more detail how reconstruction and transformation are used in image processing. They'll also offer their thoughts on dealing with the unique challenges of performing CT experiments on material science samples. Now, please note, if you missed any of the previous webinars, you can view them on the Ragaku website. Now, before we start, a few housekeeping items. This is going to be an interactive session, and we'll be taking your questions during the webcast and answering them during the session. So please don't wait until the end to ask. And as usual, please submit those questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now, I won't be monitoring the raised hand function, and I'll be posting relevant links in the chat window. I will be trying to answer as many questions as we can during the webinar, and we'll respond to any unanswered questions after the session is complete. If for whatever reason you have difficulty viewing the webinar live, please note that it is being recorded and you'll be able to view the recording beginning tomorrow. And with that said, I'll turn it over to Aya and Angela. Thanks, Tom and Angela. And thanks to everyone for joining us for the workshop. We are presenting live from our office in the Woodlands, Texas, as always. And today we're gonna demystify reconstruction, which is probably one of the most important concepts for X-ray CT, but it can be also the most confusing part of it. So we're gonna review the theory and also some of the calculations on using hands-on exercises. So here are the things we're gonna cover today. What is reconstruction? Just to cover the basics, uh, we're gonna answer this question first. Then we will review concepts as, uh, such as radon transformation and sinograms. Then we will take a look at how the filtered back projection algorithm works. And then we will go through the theory first. Then, as always, we're going to use Fiji, on, which is a distribution of ImageJ, as a tool to do some hands-on exercises. And Fiji works on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Um, additional to Fiji, which has a lot of plugins, but we also use the Radon Transform plugin. This is going to be the, uh, the main plugin we are using today. And Tom will be putting um, links to download those tools on in the chat as we go. So if you don't have them yet, you can uh, download them later. Okay, so let's start with this question. So what is reconstruction? Over the years, I realized that, that there are some people who are a little bit confused about which exact part counts as a reconstruction in the CT image processing. So let's make sure that everybody's on the same page about what it is. So this is an example of 2D projections. This is what you measure when you do a CT scan. Then this is an example of cross sections of a CT or 3D volume data. And you might also see uh, data represented in this way. This is a 3D rendered view. The calculation you use to go from the 2D projections to a set of cross sections, which is a 3D volume data. This process is what we call reconstruction. Once you have a set of cross sections or 3D volume data, then you can display it in 3D rendered view, but this is just a visual representation. Um, re rendering itself is not reconstruction. Reconstruction is a process of going from the projections to the cross sections or going from 2D to 3D. Now, when you do that reconstruction calculation, as you can imagine, it's important to understand what kind of X-ray geometry you use for the data collection. You might be using the parallel beam geometry in which you have the incident X-ray beam coming into the sample or the object, and the X-rays go through the sample and hit the detector and create the projection image. You might use the fan beam geometry or the cone beam geometry. As you can imagine, as you go from the parallel beam geometry to the cone beam geometry, calculation gets a little bit more complicated. 
So to keep it simple, we're going to focus on the parallel beam geometry today. But if you're interested, there is a good on uh, YouTube video by Professor Rich Radeke that shows how you can apply the theory you're going to learn today and apply that to the fan beam geometry. So you can see how that's extended to different geometries. Okay, so we're going to stick with the parallel beam geometry. Also, we're going to assume that we have a monochromatic radiation. Now, um, with this parallel beam geometry, you measure the projections on this detector, and you usually collect the multiple of them. Now, before we move forward, we would like to ask the audience a question. So I'm going to hand this over to Angela. All right, so I'm going to launch a poll question. This is a true or false question, and we'd like the, you, the audience, to answer um, true or false. If we have enough 2D projections, we can algebraically reconstruct the original 3D absorption coefficient distribution. Do you think that is true or is that false? So I'm going to give everybody just a little bit of time so they everybody gets a chance to vote. And it's pretty About much halfway through. <laughs> half of the people have voted so far, and it's leaning heavily one way or so. Just a couple more seconds for those who still want to vote, then I'm going to close it. So I'm going to close in three, two, one. I'm going to share the results. So you, the audience, in a large part, think this is a true statement. So I is going to tell us uh, whether that's true or it's false. Go so back to you. Okay. So most of you uh, got this right. It is true. If you have enough number of projections, you can algebraically calculate the original structure or the CT scan. And we'll, we'll see how exactly that's done, okay? So when you do reconstruction calculation, actually there are quite a few different ways of doing it. And those are some of the examples. And the first one, as you can see from its name, it's called the algebraic reconstruction. I can't say this word, right? Algebraic. <laughs> <laughs> We're practicing multiple times. Anyway, it's often um, abbreviated as ART, A -R -T. but anyway, this technique does this calculation just by purely solving equations. And I will show you how this one works because this is a very basic way of doing it um, by using a very simple case. So to keep it simple, we're going to think about a sample that has only four pixels in it. And each pixel has a different absorption coefficient, mu1 to mu4, and the pixel size is an S. So to do the CT scan, this is just a measurement, you can put X-ray beam through the sample. Let's say you start with the I sub zero, that's the intensity of the X-ray beam, and it comes out as I sub one, two, or I sub three, four, depending on where the X-ray beam went through the sample. So now we have two data points, I one, two, and I three, four. Then you change the direction of the X-ray beam and then you can get two more data points, I one, three, and I two, four. And at this point, we have four data points and you can describe those values this way using the absorption coefficient mu1 to mu4. Now we got four unknown numbers, mu1, 2, 3, and 4, and then we have four data points from the intensity measurement of the projections. This means that you can simply solve these relational equations to calculate what mu1 through mu4 were. So this is how the algebraic reconstruction technique works. Uh, this, in theory, proves that X-ray CT works. This is not some sort of magic or cheating. This actually works, and you can figure out what the sample looks like. Okay. Now, this, although, is not the common way people do this today. And the most commonly used reconstruction technique is the filtered back projection. So this is the one we're going to review today. But before we get into it, we have another question for the audience. Okay, so we're gonna launch the next poll question. 
Uh, and that question is, what is the advantage of the filtered back projection over the algebraic reconstruction or ART technique? Is it that filtered back projection suppresses artifacts? Is it faster? Or does it need fewer projections? So we've got a few votes coming in. Just give everybody a few a little bit of time. We're approaching half, so we'll give a few more seconds, get a few more votes in, and it's pretty even this time, Aya. All right, so we're yeah, gonna, it seems pretty even. <laughs> yes, it is. So I'm gonna close in three, two, one, and I'm gonna share the results. And it's pretty spread, pretty, you know, 30, 37, 33% for each of the answers. So I is gonna fill us in on which of these is most correct. So I'll stop sharing and back to you. Okay. So I guess it's kind of good that it's split because this means that uh, two thirds of you will learn something new. You also so didn't the, give the answer in advance. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so filter the back projection. There are many benefits, but the one of the main benefits is that it, its calculation is faster. So when you think about it, if you use the algebraic reconstruction technique, when you have four pixels, it's not a big deal. You can probably do this with pen and paper, but it can get really complicated and slow when you go up to like 3000 pixels cube. So that's why one of the reasons why we use a uh, filter to back projection technique uh, more often. Okay. Now, um, before we get into I'm gonna do a lot of teas today. Before we get into how filter the back projection works, I would like to discuss this. What is projection data to begin with? This is important because the name back projection kind of comes from what projection is. So let's say this is a sample or an object that we wanna scan. And for convenience, we're gonna define X and Y axis this way. And if you pick one spot or point in the sample or the object, you will see absorption coefficient mu x, y. And that mu changes depending on the location in the sample. It's not a uniform material. Then you take an x-ray beam. Let's say it's intense is I zero and the x-ray beam goes through the sample. Then you put a detector at the end of the path and you will see a projection. And then we're gonna call this P on P theta. So for the projection P, we will define this axis S, which is parallel to the X-ray beam, and axis T that is perpendicular to the X-ray beam direction. And T is tilted from axis X for theta. So on the detector side, depending on which spot or the pixel you look at, that's the T-axis, and also which angle X-ray is coming from, that's theta, you will get a projection P for T and theta location. So those are the coordinates we're gonna use uh, from now on. Now let's just focus on, so this is a projection, but we're gonna just look at a one X-ray beam at a time. So if this X-ray beam intensity is I zero and it comes out at intensity I, the ratio between the two, I uh, divided by I zero can be calculated as exponential minus mu S if the absorption coefficient is uniform in the sample. And S is the thickness, by the way, at that location. But because mu is not constant in the sample, we're gonna change this equation this way using uh, the fact that the mu is a function of x and y. Okay. Then we will take minus logarithmic of what we are looking at here. And this is the projection p t theta. What's significant here is that if you know the absorption coefficient distribution, the entire structure of the sample, you can calculate the projection. And that's not how you do the measurement, but we have the equation that expresses a relationship between the two. So the conversion from mu absorption coefficient xy to projection pt theta, this conversion is called Radon transform or forward projection. Just terminology wise, and you might hear this term Radon transform and what it is, is the conversion from mu 
xy to p t theta. Now, let's take a look at an actual image and see what happens when you apply this radon transformation. So we're going to look at this kind of cross section of an egg like sample. So black indicates air, which doesn't absorb a lot of x-rays, and white indicates something dense, and gray indicates something a little less dense or less absorbing. You can convert this mu xy uh, structure at a cross section to p projection, t and theta on the figure. And you can apply radon transformation and obtain an image like this. And this image is called a cyanogram. Cyanogram is a radon transformation of the original structure. Okay. Now, just to help you uh, connect those two, mu xy and p t theta, we're going to look at, at different angles. So in mu xy, if you put x-ray beam into this direction, let's call this zero degree, the projection you're going to get there is plotted here. If you do 45 degrees angle projection, then that projection gets plotted here at theta 45. If you do 90 degrees, then you put the projection at the center of the sinogram. So this is how you do the measurement of a CT scan, then collect the results in sinogram. Another way to look at this relationship is to focus on one spot in the sample. That spot in, I'm going to just call it the egg yolk, that spot is going to move through the sinogram like this when you scan from zero to 180 degrees. And that curve is essentially a sine curve, and that's kind of where the name sinogram comes from. And there is a group of people who created uh, this movie to help people understand or at least visualize how. Uh, projection measurement is kind of put together in a sinogram. Now, you might be at this point thinking, that, okay, uh, now I kind of know what sinogram is, but why are we doing this? You know, <laughs> why do we need a sinograms? So before I answer that question, uh, let us ask you the same question. All right, so we're gonna launch our next question. And we'd like you to answer, what are the benefits of sinograms? Do you think it's because some image processing necessary for reconstruction is simpler to apply to sinograms in the individual radiographs? Or perhaps that sources of artifacts are easily identified in sinograms? Or perhaps that sinograms can make data collection faster? Or is it a combination of the first two items in our list? So we've got about half of you that have voted thus far. So we'll give a few more seconds and very heavily leaning one way mm -hmm. the audience is. So I'm gonna give, close the poll in three, two, one. I'm gonna share the results with you. And the audience mostly believes the answer is a combination of A and B. So Aya's gonna stop sharing and send it back to Aya. Okay. So that is correct. So I guess uh, at least many of you know what sinograms are used for. Okay, so let me just close this one. And one of the, um, as I see it, the biggest benefits of sinograms is that it makes it really easy to identify the causes of artifacts because things are supposed to follow the sine curve Anything that looks a little different or off from the sine curve, you can tell that something went wrong during the measurement. So I'm going to show you some examples next. So this is a sinogram, the correct one, with no problem coming from that egg cross section. If you see something like those, you can immediately tell that something went wrong. So this one, for example, has a straight vertical line running through the image. And that really doesn't belong a correct sinogram. You, sh you shouldn't be seeing any straight line in this. And when you see a vertical line like this one, that usually indicates that either the source or the detector went dark in the middle of a measurement. And that, that's what it indicates. And that can be a problem. Next one is a little bit subtle. 
But if you draw straight lines like this, you realize that uh, the top of the sample, the gray part here and the bottom right here, they should come back to the same location when you go from zero to 180 degrees. But they both kind of shifted downwards and that indicates that the sample moved during the scan and that can be a problem too. And the last one, again, it's kind of subtle, but you see those horizontal lines. And this is probably one of the most commonly seen uh, artifacts. Those horizontal lines indicate that you have either hot, cold, or dead pixels, or non-uniformly um, reacting detector pixels. And they usually cause the ring artifacts, the infamous uh, ring artifacts. Now, we will use those um, sinograms with the problems and re do the reconstruction to see what kind of artifacts they cause in the hands-on exercise uh, part. But the point I wanted to make with this slide is that the sinograms, looking at them is a really good way to um, identify what's causing the artifacts or something that went wrong during the measurement. Okay. So going back to this egg cross-section, now we know that you can do radon transform or forward projection to obtain a sinogram. And this kind of indicates that we measure the sinogram because that's a collection of projections. But that means that you can do some sort of backward calculation based on the sinograms or the projections. You can calculate the cross-section. And that's how um, back projection method works. So let's see how that process actually looks like. So how does filtered back projection work? So if you have a sample that looks like this and you put X-ray beam into this direction, you can get a projection that looks like this at zero degree. You can do the same thing at 90 degrees and get another projection then you can just keep going and get multiple projections. Normally, you would get hundreds and thousands of them, but you know, just to keep it simple, we're going to look at only four different directions. Then let's take a look at this one projection, and we're going to convert this projection into gray scale. So no absorption becomes uh, dark gray or black, and a high absorption or high density is represented as light gray in this case. Then what we do here is we're gonna back project this image to the cross section. We're gonna put this back to the cross section. And we're gonna do this for different angles. This is 180 degrees and this is 90 degrees. Then all you have to do actually is just to add them together and normalize it. So this is the result of a back projection from two projection angles. This might not look like much, but you can see the rough location and the size of the egg. And you can even tell that there was a gray yolk inside of it. And you can kind of tell where it was. So this is a whole lot of information you can get from just two projections. Now, as I said, normally you use more projections. So if you use four, it might look just like this. If you do 8, 24, and 120, at this point, you can clearly, maybe not clearly, but see the shape of the egg, and you can see where the yolk is. So this is how back projection part of the calculation works. So this is all good, but everything looks uh, very blurry. So the question is, you know, what causes the blurriness? This is where I kind of have to go back to the diagram and a little bit of the uh, math, so bear with me. So remember this diagram, we have an object and that it has the absorption coefficient distribution of a mu x, y, and that's the answer we are trying to get to. Now, you can calculate just, you know, you might say why or what for, but just stay with me. You can calculate a 2D Fourier transform of the original structure. And we're gonna just call this uh, FUV. Well, I'm gonna skip 
a lot of math here, but if you follow all the calculations, you realize that the 1D Fourier transform of the projection PT theta is a slice of FUV like this. The projection PT theta is a slice of the Fourier transform of the original structure F at the same angle of theta. And this is called uh, Fourier slice theorem. And if you're interested in following the calculation to prove this, uh, there is another good YouTube video by the same uh, Professor Richard Radeke. And if you're interested on, in the calculation, I would highly recommend his video. Um, another video I'm gonna mention here is, if you do any X-ray diffraction or scattering or imaging analysis, you cannot get away from Fourier transform. It shows up everywhere. If you have never quite grasped what Fourier transform was or why it's so convenient or why it shows up everywhere, uh, there is a really good video by uh, three blue, one brown about Fourier transform, which explains what it is and why it's so convenient um, visually. So I recommend his video to um, if you're interested in the theory of Fourier transform. So anyway, let's for now assume that this uh, Fourier slice theorem is correct. Then what this means is you can measure a projection, a projection at theta, and that gives you this one line or slice in the Fourier space. If you do a scan from zero to 180 or 360, you can add them all together to get the full Fourier transformation of the original structure. Now at this point, all you have to do is to calculate the inverse Fourier transform to get the original structure. So we don't need to solve any relational equations or anything. You can just simply follow this process to get the original structure. Now, this works, but the calculation is slow. So I should have mentioned that when you do filter the back projection, you do the inverse Fourier transform before you add everything. You do it on in 1D before you do the 2D Fourier transform. But anyway, the concept still is valid. Now, we're talking about this because we want to understand where the blurriness is coming from. So let's get to the point. So I said that the uh, you can get a slice of the FUV, the Fourier transform in the space, but nothing is really a point or a line when you do real calculations. So this is not just a straight line slice, but it has a width. It looks more like a rectangular in reality. So this means if you take one projection and put this rectangular here and take another one, another one, and add them together, you end up having something like this. And because this line or those lines have a width, the center part is going to have a lot of data points added together. And you, you're going to have high number there. But towards the edge, the, you have a kind of scarce data points and you don't really have a lot of purple out there. So this is not gonna work really well. And this is the reason where you get the blurriness if you don't do anything when you do the back projection calculation. So instead of adding them together simply, we have to downweight the center part of this rectangular. So instead of this, we add a filter to change its shape like this so that the center part is downweighted then you add them together so that you have a uniform distribution of data points. And this is the filtered part comes from in the filter to back projection. Okay, so this is without the filter. If you add a ramping filter to this process, you can get a projection, I'm sorry, a cross section that looks like this. And this is very much close to the original cross section. So this is where the filter comes in and now we've uh, I hope, I know it's a bit complicated, but I hope you understand where the blurriness comes from. Now, what kind of filters are available? There are um, several different filters you can use, and this slide shows only a few examples, but all of them have this downweighing shape towards the center. Now, what kind of a difference do they cause? So that's the next question we wanna ask you. 
Yes, and this is a, another true false question. Uh, is it true or false that different filters only affect the sharpness of the reconstructed image? So I'd like the audience to vote. Do you think that's true? Do you think that's false? I guess it's about leaning half. towards kind of a long way. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely <laughs> is. Not unanimous. Not yeah. unanimous. Yep. All right. I'm going to give just a few more seconds, say three, two, one. I'm going to close the poll now. I'm going to share the results with uh, you, the audience. And more of you think this is false than true. So let's see what Aya tells us. Okay, I'll stop so sharing. collectively, you're mostly right. <laughs> the statement is false. So let's see uh, the difference of two different filters. We're going to compare a uh, ramp filter and a hand filter. Let's say this is the original or the ground truth uh, cross section. You can uh, radon transform this image and reconstruct it, you know, calculate back what it was using the ramp filter and you get a result that looks like this. If you use a hand filter, it would look like this. It's a very subtle difference, not a whole lot. But if you look at the ramp filter uh, results, the borderline or the line around the white circles look pretty sharp. It's a good resolution, but um, the white circles look kind of gray, meaning that you have a little bit lowered contrast. And because of that, you see a little bit of a noise level increased as well. On the other hand, the hand filter reconstru reconstruction result has a little bit better contrast and less noise. However, the edge of those circles look a little bit blurred. So both the resolution and the contrast are affected by which filter you use. Okay, so um, probably you had enough of the theory part. So we're gonna move on to the hands-on exercises, but let's take some questions before we move on. All right, so yeah, we've had a, we've had a few come in. Um, okay. The first one dates back to uh, algebraic reconstruction. Mm -hmm. I think it was slide uh, like 14. And so it's kind of, when do you use algebraic reconstruction? Seems like it's, you know, uh, time consuming, but when, when would you choose to do that? That's a good question. Um, so algebraic, <laughs> algebraic <laughs> construction technique, <laughs> the calculation is a slow, but um, it has less artifacts because we're doing more honest calculation. Also, it tolerates a lower number of projections better than a filter to back projection. For that reason, it's sometimes used for medical CT on applications because reducing the number of um, projections means that you can reduce the dosage. And you don't wanna get a whole lot of radiation you know, when you do a CT scan. But when you do that, the, you don't need to deal with a whole lot of artifacts. So for that reason, it can be used for medical CT purposes sometimes. Okay, all right. Uh, the next question is, uh, in what situation can we apply the radon transform essentially in, in real data sets? Where, what's the, what's the uh, draw to, you know, apply the radon transformation. When would you ever use it for practical reasons? Yes, yes. I think that's an excellent uh, way to frame um, it. So I'm going to say never. <laughs> <laughs> but it exists. But it exists. Be because you don't know the real cross-section usually, right? If you mm -hmm. already have the cross-section, you don't need to do a CT scan. The whole point of a CT scan or measurement is you don't have the cross section. So you do a projection measurements and you do the backwards version of radon transform. But we are talking about radon transform because without understanding radon transform, you don't understand the back projection because it's a back calculation of radon transform. So in theory, it's important to understand it. And we have this, radon transform plugin, which we're gonna use in the exercises. Um, 
to help us understand how it works and get a better feel of it. Also, you can easily experiment what happens when you reduce the number of projections, for example, when you change the filter. And it helps us do a lot of kind of thought experiments without doing actual experiment. So it's more for learning experiences. Um, but uh, yeah, in a real measurements, you wouldn't be doing radon transform. Right, right. OK, OK. Um, next question is, is the sinogram used to find the center of rotation? Um, and actually, I think you can even reframe it to, um, can you predict the center of rotation as well? You can. Right you can, sinogram, yes. right? Mm -hmm. That's another good use of it. OK, OK. Uh, final couple of questions at this point. I'm sure we'll have more before we uh, roll, after we roll the dice. Uh, during the filtered back projections, how many projections is enough? OK, that, that's a very good question, you know, a practical question. Yeah. So it always depends on the sample and the measurement, other measurement conditions. However, uh, there is a good rule of thumb, which is you divide the field of view by the voxel size. And that's the number uh, you should use a rule of thumb, a good number of projections. For example, if you have um, one millimeter field of view, and if you have one micron voxel size, 1,000 projections is a good number to use. And you might wonder you know, where does that calculation come from? And it comes from the um, algebraic reconstruction theory, meaning that remember that we had a two by two pixels. That means you know, um, that number, the field of view divided by the voxel size is two in that case. And we use zero degree and a 90 degree two projections. And that was all we needed to calculate the original structure. So that's where it comes from. You divide the field of view by the voxel size, and that's the number you want, um, or you can use as a guideline. Anything significantly smaller than that number can cause a lot of artifacts. Anything a lot bigger than that number uh, would be a waste of time. OK. All right, and the final question that's come in before the uh, hands-on part is how is resolution affected by the number of projections? So the resolution um, in terms of the voxel size is not directly affected by the number of projections. However, on um, if the number of projections is a lot lower than FOV divided by the voxel size number, then you will have a lot of artifacts, usually that shows up as radial lines. And those lines will get in the way for you to identify objects or recognize the interface or makes the segmentation difficult, thus practically reduces the resolution. Okay, okay. All right, so I think, yeah, that's all the questions we have now. Okay. So um, hopefully we'll get a few more, um, and then we'll uh, we'll roll the dice and answer the rest of those questions after that. <laughs> okay. So let me switch the screen. Let me do this. Give me one sec. Do you see the right screen? There it is. Okay. Yes. So I have a Fiji open and I got a couple of images. Um, those sample images are available for you too so that you can do the same um, exercises. So let's take a look at this egg. The gray level is a little bit different from the one we were looking at on in the PowerPoint slides, but nonetheless, this is the egg looking cross section. So let's calculate uh, radon transformation, radon transform of this cross section. And to do that, we're going to go to plugins menu. Then I'm looking for radon transform. Okay. And this is the radon transform plugin interface. And there are a lot of parameters on, but we're going to just worry about a few of them today. So number of scans, this is automatically set depending on the size of the cross-section you're looking at. And angular increments, 
So if you say one degree, uh, we're assuming the parallel beam geometry. So the scan is only from zero to 180 degrees. So one degree increment means you're going to have 180 projections. If you change this to two, for example, you get 90. And if it's one, you have 180. And we will take a look at the filter um, in a second. So you have this cross section and you're going to just click calculate to obtain a set of projections or a sinogram. And this is a sinogram calculated on the one degree increments. So this is how you can use this plugin to get the sinogram. And this sinogram on is what you usually measure because this is the collection of projections. So that means you should be able to reconstruct this egg using this sinogram. Let's try this without the filter first. I'm gonna turn this off, okay, and click reconstruct. And if you don't use the filter, as we saw before, you get this very much blurred image. But if you turn this back on and you can choose different filters and compare them, we'll do that in a second too, but I'm gonna just stay with the default ramping filter and do the reconstruction, then you get this. This is almost exactly, maybe a little bit blurred than the original, but this is pretty close to the original scan. So using this calculation, you know, you can see, or this is a proof that filter the back projection works. If you measure the projections, you can calculate the cross section of the original structure. Now, as an experiment, Let's see what happens if you change the number of projections. So I'm gonna close all those and suddenly you can see a drastic change. I'm gonna change the angular increments to 60 degrees. That means you're gonna measure only three projections from this sample and calculate it. And those are the projections. It might look like just one straight line, but if you zoom into it, you can see that there are three projections. And if we use those to do the reconstruction, oops, I want to keep them on. You get something like this. So you can see roughly the shape and location of the egg and also where the yolk is, but you see all those very pronounced lines. And this is a typical artifact uh, coming from low number of projections. You probably wouldn't see something this drastic in everyday measurements, but you might have seen kind of slight subtle lines in the measurement. And usually that indicates that you might want to increase the number of projections to get rid of that artifact. So I would uh, encourage you to use different cross sections, maybe different angular increments and different filters. Uh, to kind of get better feel of how this technique works and how radon transform uh, works. Now, what I want to do next is to take a look at the um, sinograms that I have problems. And to do that, you can click import data to import different sinograms. And the one I want to open first is this one. Okay, I click columns. So this sinogram has dark vertical line. This is one of the examples we saw on uh, in the PowerPoint. So let's see what happens if you just go ahead and reconstruct those projections. So I'm going to click reconstruct. And this is the result. So when you look at the sinogram, this looks like a really drastic change of intensity. It looks like a really big problem, but this is just one of the many projections. So it turns out that you do get some artifacts on kind of streaking in one direction, but it's not too drastic. But nonetheless, when you see something like this, now you can kind of look at the original sinogram and say, oh, maybe this is what's causing the streak. It's really easy to tell. So that's a vertical line uh, when the detector or the source goes dark. Let's take a look at another 
example. So this is the one that's kind of subtle. If you don't look at it closely, you wouldn't realize that there is something wrong about it. But this top of the gray area, that should come back to the same height when the sample rotates 180 degrees. But you can see that it's a little bit lower. And this type of distortion of sinogram indicates that the sample moved during the scan. Though the distortion looks subtle in this image, if you do reconstruction based on those projections, you get a really bad artifact, as you can see here. The egg doesn't even have a straight line or a clear shape at this point. And you see this half circle shaped artifact or the streak in this case, because we are doing a zero to 180 degrees uh, scan. This could look like a full donut circle on if you are doing zero to 360 degrees scan. But nonetheless, uh, this type of artifact indicates that the sample might've been moving during the scan. The last example I want to show you um, is probably the most common uh, cause of artifacts, the horizontal lines. Those horizontal lines indicate that there are some bad pixels on the detector because this line is coming from one single pixel and the same thing for the lighter one and darker ones. If you do a reconstruction using this image, you get something like this. So this might look familiar to some of you. Again, the ring is only halfway because this is zero to 180 degrees scan. But if you do zero to 360, this becomes a full circle. And this is the, you know, where the infamous or notorious ring artifacts come from. And it's coming from bad pixels. And uh, the remedy for this usually is to do a good detector calibration to either eliminate or correct uh, those pixels or reduce the difference among the pixels. Okay. Now we've probably had enough of this egg. So let's take a look at something else. So this image, um, this is the full view of the white circles we saw before. Let's use this one to see the difference of the filters. Okay. So to do that, I'm gonna calculate the sinogram first. Okay, so this is a sinogram. Then we're gonna do the reconstruction of this bird picture using the ramp filter first. So this is the result of the ramp filter. Now we're going to do it again with a different filter. I, this time I'm going to use a hand filter and do the same thing. Okay, so this is a hand filter. And let's take a look at them more closely. So both filters did a pretty good job, right? But um, if you zoom into, let's say this nose area, This is 600% better. It's the same scale. So this is the original, very good contrast and a pretty good resolution and a sharp borderline. The ramp filter gives you more or less the same you know, sharp borderline, but this area becomes more gray and noisy. And a hand filter, is less noisy and you have a better contrast, but you can see this borderline is a little bit blurred. So again, this is just an experiment by calculation, but by trying different images and different filters, you can get a feel of which filter does what to the uh, reconstruction images. Okay, the last exercise I wanna do is because I've been doing everything by using just one cross section. You might be wondering, you know, does this work for 3D volume? And yes, it does. Um, and so that you can give it a try. The sample data set includes this shark tooth. So this is a TIFF stack. So you have a multiple cross sections. And if you want to look at this in 3D, you can go to plugins and go to volume viewer. 
Let me zoom in a little bit. So you see the 3D shape. So this is a CT scan, um, 3D image of a tooth of a shark. Now, what I want to show you is you can use this stack to do the same exercise. So to calculate the sinogram for the entire volume, you have to check do entire stack. And I'm going to change this to two degrees just to save time and run the calculation. We can probably take a question while we're waiting for this. All right, so we did have one come in. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is, does the calculation in image J assume a monochromatic X-ray source? Yes, it does. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and it doesn't matter what that source is. It's just assuming monochromatic period, right? It doesn't care about the energy or anything like that. No, because we're using the grain level of the absorption coefficient that's okay. determined by whatever X-ray energy you're using and also whatever sample you have. All right. Perfect timing. <laughs> Perfect timing, right? I was trying to draw it out. I was trying to draw it out. <laughs> <laughs> so if you use a 3D volume to do the radon transformation, you will have multiple sinograms, and they are coming from uh, different Z axis, right? So this is all for 3D too. And you can use the set of sinograms to, again, reconstruct the original structure. And you can do that too using this radon transform plugin. I can probably take more questions, but uh, I guess we don't have new questions. Yeah, no, there's no new questions at the moment. So we'll. Uh... Let's wait for this one to uh, to bang out really quick. Mm -hmm. You're not falling asleep, are you, everyone? <laughs> There's lots of it, people it, saying hi in the chat, so okay. we know, <laughs> we know they're listening. We know that they are still listening, okay. so we're glad they're all here. <laughs> yes, yeah, Cassia says we are here. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. <laughs> yes, we all are. Thanks so much. That's the thing. I mean, it's convenient that we can do this online and a lot of people from different locations can join us. Yeah, but yeah. Um, it's just never the same as you do this in the classroom. Oh, it's done. Right. Okay. So now we have reconstructed tooth. I don't know if you can see this. You see those subtle lines? And that's um, the artifact coming from the fact that we're using only 90 projections. Nonetheless, this is a decent reconstruction of the original image. And you can go back to the volume viewer. Now we are looking at this um, reconstruction, not the original image okay i don't know why it's zoomed in so much but okay so you can see that the three-dimensional shark tooth got reconstructed using the sinogram so you can do the same 3d as well okay now let's wrap this up let me go back to the powerpoint okay do you see the slide we do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we just covered uh, what reconstruction is. Now you understand which exact part is reconstruction in the entire process. And we um, looked at radon transformation in the sinograms. Now you understand what those two things are and what they're for. And also we reviewed how the filtered bat projection algorithm works. Um, before we go into the game on uh, and also the taking more questions q a session i just wanted to uh, mention if you like our content please subscribe to our email updates it's a kind of monthly ish newsletter and if you subscribe you'll be um 
always updated or informed when we have a new webinar workshop coming up or when we have a new application example or blog articles published. And we also recommend a good or interesting papers or books to read. So if you're interested, uh, please subscribe. I think Tom, you can put a link in the chat. I did, I okay. did. Now, if you came here to get a gift card, it's time Not to play chance. the game. So we'll make yeah. no promises. <laughs> this is your make chance. No promises, except we're going to try a different die this time. I know it's a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we're going to use a different die. It's also, still I... six sided. So <laughs> yes. all, the, uh, all the numbers are still there. And if you were here before, uh, you probably know how this works. It's a, if you're here for the first time, it's a very simple game. So you can pick a number as Angela is showing you. On um, We kind of change the order of the numbers to see if the results changes. <laughs> and Tom is gonna roll a die. And if you pick the number he gets, you will win a $30 gift card. See, we don't see the Gaussian peak anymore. We always no, have a peak we did right, now. right in the middle, so three yeah. and four. Well, it's it's still kind of there. Oh, four, it's though. just, yeah, yeah four. three and like four, good? you can see that it ramps. Uh, I want to know again. the psychology of this. Why Me is it this yeah. random? <laughs> Me too. All right. So I really hope that we have a lot more winners this time. Yeah. Um, any more votes? Not everybody's picked a number. Yeah. Uh, if you still want to pick one, go ahead and I'll close this in just a couple of seconds to give everybody a chance to get in. And you'll get to see what everybody has picked as well. So I'm going to end this now. Three two one <laughs> i'm ending it i'm sharing the results so um All still right. number four is the most popular it is. Yeah, it we're, probably gonna is. Roll, we're probably gonna roll it a is. one again because only two people chose it so yeah, let's right. not do that here's tom the, here's the die i get something better oh hey all right so let me do that it is in fact a three, three. we have six winners six. today six that's yeah. not bad <laughs> also Better. not bad so if you picked three, you know that you did, and we will send you the gift card by email within a day or two. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations, guys. Yes. I'll All stop right. sharing. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see if there are more questions. We've had a few good questions. Um, okay. <laughs> one of them, I got to find it though. It got posted in the chat and then it got buried by uh, some people that won who are very excited here. Uh, <laughs> So nice. um, Ahmad is asking, and actually this is something we can, you can uh, perhaps send an email, is asking about a thin section for a rock sample and run similar step analysis, similar steps of analysis using ImageJ okay. um, for a thin section. So that might be something that... Uh, I guess it's an optical microscope. That sounds images. like an optical mm -hmm. versus an x-ray, but um, the steps should be the same, I guess, I imagine. If you already have a slice image, if I understand it correctly, you don't need to do anything, right? You don't need to do radar and transform reconstruction. We do reconstruction because we cannot directly measure the cross section for CT. I might right. be misunderstanding your question, but let's see. Uh, yes. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see if he uh, if he posts again okay. if that if that does that. Okay, so we've got a few more questions, and we'll try and make these uh, try and make these quick so that uh, everybody can be on their way. So, um, do the calculations change when you have a polychromatic beam, or is there any situation where there's a polychromatic beam? I Good question. <laughs> so the thing is, uh, we don't change the calculation when you have a polychromatic beam, which is the case for most of the CT scanners. And because the beam is not no longer monochromatic, but we don't change the calculation, and that mismatch of the experiment and the calculation causes the beam hardening artifacts. That's where that beam hardening artifacts come from. If we do the correct calculation, if you understand the dis energy distribution of incoming X-rays, and if you can more or less guess or at least estimate the absorption coefficient the sample has, you can uh, take that into account to do uh, reconstruction calculation. If you do do that, you can reduce the beam hardening 
artifacts, but commonly we just keep assuming a monochromatic radiation we, when we have a polychromatic radiation and that mismatch causes the beam hardening artifacts. Okay. okay. Um, the next question is actually two from the same person. One is, the first one is, is there, are there image corrections in image J like there are in reconstruction software? And I think I'm gonna ask him to be more specific about which specific reconstruction software he's talking about. Or Maybe which green. correction he's looking for. Yeah, or which right. correction. Uh, oh, so it's a Ni Nikon software. I'm not. I'm not mm -hmm. certain. Yeah, we. I can't speak for, um, for about how Nikon recons reconstruction software works. But if you're wondering if there are artifacts corrections available in Image J, that radon transform plugin we're using uh, doesn't do that. But if you have an idea of how to correct artifacts, you know, your own way, you could have used ImageJ to do that. Yeah, he was, he specifically now just said beam hardening. Yeah, for beam hardening. Um, the radon transform plugin doesn't do that. Uh, there might be different recall. Google search does show on GitHub a macro, um, but I've not tried it before. A beam hardening correction. So there, there is at least macro. one available. <laughs> <laughs> at least yeah. one, and yeah. there's yeah. at least a publication or two. So mm -hmm. quick Google search. Maybe we'll look at that later as well. Yeah, and some other, some other um, uh, image, image uh, processing here, noise reduction, scatter reduction. I assume there's, you know, there's somebody probably has a plug-in to help with some of that. Uh, so that's, that's a- but One uh, thing keep in mind though, if you're going to use ImageJ on is that because it doesn't utilize a GPU, uh, most plugins don't. The calculation can be very, very slow if you try to do everything in ImageJ, especially for reconstruction calculation. Okay. And then uh, the final question from, from Roger is, can we use images obtained with a cone beam system with ImageJ? So you uh, not with right. this particular uh, radon transform plugin we use. This one assumes only parallel beam geometry. Okay, now there was something that came in. Uh, uh, so um, Ahmad, you're asking again, you're asking kind of questions of, uh, of an optical microscope as opposed to a um, X-ray microscope. So I'm not sure we'll have a quite answer to this, but it's how do you remove or reduce, he's calling it the shiny appearance of grains in a photo. And I think that's, mm. again, that's more on the optical more in the image processing but not necessarily about reconstruction but yeah yeah it's hard to answer that question um for two reasons because i'm not an optical microscopy specialist um and also it's hard to tell without seeing the image i'm sorry i, I wish yeah. i had something better to say but yeah no i think there's there's probably lots of that the optical imaging software that's that that handles that but uh and also there are a lot of um i think plugins in some youtube videos uh, that show you how to deal with those image processing and corrections using image okay. images is more commonly used for uh 2d or optical you know images rather than ct actually so right right all right, so that's actually, that's all the questions that we have today. So um, minutes, none of you will be hearing over. us except for the winners. And so uh, we can we can kick on to the next slide here, Aya. Okay. We'll wrap it up. So uh, we will be holding a uh, another session, or I'm sorry, I, I skipped. And as I said earlier, <laughs> sorry, uh, a recording of the webinar will be available tomorrow and an email will go out to all the registrants with instructions on how to view the recorded presentation. Uh, links to the resources mentioned today will also be shared on the landing page. And we'll be holding a session on applying image processing using Dragonfly on Wednesday the, 20, Wednesday the 15th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. We look forward to seeing all of you then. Thanks for joining us, and we will talk again in June. Bye Thanks, now. everyone.